Newton Talk Gay Push. We have a new video today. It's the Bee's Knees by the big cheese himself, Mr. Linegar. Let's make history today as we jaw over Unit 7, Day 10. But first, let's do our daily punishment. Did you hear about that cheese factory that exploded in France? There was nothing left but debris. <laughs> Brie. <laughs> your key terms for today? The Helsinki Accords. Gerald Ford. Title IX. Roe v. Wade. The Equal Rights Amendment, Phyllis Schlafly, Jimmy Carter, the Department of Energy, the Malay Speech, the Camp David Accords, the Iranian Revolution, the Iranian Hostage Crisis, SALT II, the Afghanistan Revolution, the Warren Court, Griswold v. Connecticut, Gideon v. Wainwright, Miranda v. Arizona, New York Times v. Sullivan, the Bach case, Milliken v. Bradley, and Roe v. Wade. We're going to go over the foreign policy issues under Gerald Ford and Jimmy Carter, the domestic issues under Jimmy Carter, changes in women's rights in the mid to late 1970s, and the Earl Warren Court. So let's talk about Gerald Ford first. Gerald Ford is going to inherit some of the problems of Richard Nixon. Uh, in the 1970s, people were saying there was a credibility gap in government. Uh, people did not believe the government. A lot of this was because of things like the Vietnam War and the lies that Johnson said and Nixon said. But then with Watergate, people are going to become very dissatisfied and distrustful of the government. Credibility gap. Uh, Ford becomes president. He has seen as honest people try to give him a chance. But he does inherit a lot of those uh, problems. He has inherent problems also. One of the big mistakes that Nixon does make uh, one of the big mistakes that Ford makes towards Nixon is he does pardon him. He pardons Nixon for any crimes he might have committed. The rationale why Ford did this was he wanted America to turn away from Watergate and move on with, as a country, but it made Ford look corrupt that he pardoned Nixon because Nixon committed crimes. And this is going to make a lot of people kind of turn against him and like take away the benefit of the doubt they gave Ford. Uh, the big thing that uh, Ford does as president is he keeps Kissinger as his Secretary of State, and he continues the policy of detente. He does the Helsinki Accords. This was meant to improve relationships between the communist bloc and Western nations. What the Helsinki Accords did is it recognized Soviet control over Eastern Europe. Uh, in return, the Soviet Union countries promised to have better human rights. Uh, it really doesn't really do that much. Here's Gerald Ford. He was a star football player in college. Uh, however, he got the reputation as president as being kind of clumsy. He would fall multiple times, like on his way to Air Force One. And just with like the whole like credibility gap in the 1970s, he was seen as kind of a joke. Vietnam War is going to end under Gerald Ford. Uh, in 1975, the North Vietnamese invade South Vietnam, and they quickly conquer all of Vietnam. Congress is going to refuse to give any money to the South Vietnamese. The North will easily defeat the South. The North are going to move so rapidly that the U.S. personnel are going to be still in Vietnam and they have to be evacuated quickly on helicopters. Ultimately, a half million Vietnamese people are going to come to America because otherwise they would have been killed or put into concentration camps. The total cost of the Vietnam War was $118 billion. 56,000 million, uh, 56, uh, Americans die, 300,000 wounded, over 2 million Vietnamese die. This is the last helicopter on Vietnam. You just see all these people trying to get in. Some people try to jump and grab onto the legs of the helicopter, uh, especially if you're Vietnamese, because you know that if you don't, you are in trouble. These are some refugees. Let's talk about the Earl Warren Court. The Earl Warren Court was a Supreme Court case, Supreme Court uh, in the 1950s, 60s, and a little bit of the 1970s. Uh, it's going to be very liberal, unlike the Nixon administration, although Nixon was pretty liberal domestically. Uh, the Warren Court is going to, we already talked about Brown v. Board of Education, but it's also going to do other court cases. Uh, so, for example, Griswold v. Connecticut establishes that there's an inherent right to privacy in the Constitution. Uh, Gideon v. Wainwright says that people have a right to have a lawyer provided to them, even if they can't afford it. And Miranda v. Arizona says you have a right to have your rights read to you. So these are protecting uh, criminals. A lot of conservatives like Nixon hated these court cases. New York Times v. Sullivan 
uh, protect uh, newspapers from libel or slander. Uh, the Bach case was an affirmative action case, and it said race cannot be the definitive criteria, but it can be one criteria, like a plus system, to determine whether somebody gets into college. So if like you have two people that are equally qualified, race can be used as a determining factor, but it can't be like the only thing. Milliken v. Bradley was a more conservative decision. It said that... Um, Even though uh, de facto segregation, uh, even though de, de jure segregation was illegal, remember de jure means segregation legally by the law, um, this, the courts and Congress in the 1960s have been trying to get rid of de facto segregation. De facto segregation is segregation by like custom or socioeconomics. So like, for example, Highland Park, mostly white. Uh, even though like there's no law that says African Americans or Hispanics can't live there. Uh, in the 1950s and 60s, there actually were doing illegal shady stuff like blockbusting and uh, redlining. Um, so what people tried to do in the 1960s is they tried to do busing. And what busing would be, like they would take some people from, some African Americans from uh, Dallas, uh, Red Oaks area, and they would bus them to Highland Park. They would bus the white people to uh, South Dallas. Obviously, that's going to really upper, upset the upper middle class uh, white people uh, <laughs> because now they're outraged. How dare you do this to us? We paid good money to have these houses so we didn't have to go to these school districts. Uh, they also do this in parts of the north. This is going to turn a lot of northern white people uh, against this. Uh, one of uh, Joe Biden's first uh, key positions he had was he was against busing uh, because even a lot of like white liberals were against it just because now it affects them, you know? It's easy to say you're not racist, but then when you're actually affected by it. Roe v. Wade, but Milliken v. Bradley was against busing, so it said you cannot do this like uh, district-wide busing where you're busing somebody to a different district or a different county. Uh, Roe v. Wade uh, was a Supreme Court decision that allowed women to have an abortion up until the second trimester. Uh, it said there's a, women have an inherent right to privacy in their body, going back to the Griswold v. Connecticut decision. Uh, and women will ha now have a right to have an abortion. This was recently overturned. Nixon will appoint four more justices. The, his chief justice was Berger. This will be more conservative court, but they still appoint. They still are pretty liberal or pretty moderate. They do Roe v. Wade. Roe v. Wade. This is the court, the uh, Warren Court. Let's talk about feminist victories and defeats in the 1970s. Feminists had many victories in the 1960s and 70s. Congress will pass Title IX, which you should know. This was equal funding for women's educational activities. Like a lot of times, girls get a lot less money for sports in school. This was supposed to be equal. Congress will pass the Equal Rights Amendment, but remember, for a constitutional amendment to pass, it needs to be approved by three fourths of the states. This would have guaranteed equal rights for all women, but this does not ratified, like what, it falls a couple states short. The Supreme Court will strike down sex discrimination uh, using the Equal Protection Clause and the Employment under the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Roe v. Wade is seen as a victory for feminism. Women will start to enter the professional schools and workforce in more numbers and more than just subservient roles. However, there was a lot of backlash and defeats for feminists also. There's still a huge wage gap for women during this time. There's also a backlash by Christian fundamentalist conservative women who don't like feminism. They thought feminism uh, made women mannish. Uh, they thought feminism was immoral. It increased the divorce rate. It led to premarital sex. Many conservative Christians argued that men are supposed to be the head of the household, that children are harmed by mothers who work. The whole woman that's going to lead the anti-feminist movement was Phil Schlaffy, who actually was uh, edu uh, a intellectual. She went to one of the Ivy League schools, so kind of hypocritical of her, if her whole idea of women staying at home is true. Uh, she argued she is one of the people that goes against the ERA and makes and like leads to a huge turnout to uh, get the ERA not passed, and she actually does get enough states to not support the ERA that the Equal Rights Amendment is never ratified. We do not have an Equal Rights Amendment in our Constitution. But she's a hero in the whole conservative movement as a cultural conservative warrior.
And here she is right here, Phyllis Schlaffy. All right, in, 1960, in 1976, Gerald Ford will win the Republican nomination after a tough uh, battle against Ronald Reagan. Reagan is a conservative. He's a Goldwater conservative, although he sounds much more reasonable. And he's kind of off-putting because he's very kind of funny and stuff. Uh, but Reagan will challenge uh, Ford, but Ford does eventually win. Jimmy Carter will win the Democratic nomination. He was a dark horse candidate. Uh, he was not well known. He was a former governor of Georgia. He was a peanut farmer. Uh, Carter is going to campaign on being an outsider, honest, and being a born-again evangelical Christian. He's going to try to get evangelical Christians to vote for him. Jimmy Carter is one of the first people that kind of introduced like evangelical people getting involved in politics. Carter will win a narrow majority with 51% of the vote. And Carter's going to have a disaster uh, presidency. It's going to be really bad. Carter had the benefit of strong majorities in the House and Senate, but he governed ineffectively. He had a number of problems he inherited, stagflation, high energy crossed, the post-Vietnam, post-Watergate, post-1960s loss of faith, the whole credibility gap. He's going to establish the Department of Energy because of the whole uh, energy crisis in 1970s. Uh, he's going to give amnesty to people that dodged the draft and went to Canada. He's going to say they could come back to America. Uh, stagflation is going to continue to beset the country during Carter's presidency. Uh, inflation is going to rise all the way to 13% by 1979. Carter is going to be seen as kind of impotent to being able to deal with this. He's seen as too negative. He gives a speech called the Malay speech. In the Malay speech, Carter says that America is facing a crisis of confidence and that we kind of just need to accept that we're not going to be, ever be a world power anymore and we need to be happy of what we are. It's seen as a very negative, very Debbie Downer speech. And in America, we don't like Debbie Downers. We like to be lied to. So Carter was not very successful domestically. He was not able to defeat inflation. Carter famously declared war on inflation, and inflation beat Jimmy Carter. He will have a little bit more successful successes as far as foreign policy goes. He's going to focus American foreign policy on human rights and democracy. The big thing he does is the Camp David Accords, which is his biggest foreign policy success. He gets the lead, leader of Egypt, Answar Sadat, and the Israeli prime minister uh, president, uh, Begin, to meet. Egypt and Israel had never recognized uh, Egypt had never recognized Israel as a country, and they had fought four wars since Israel was formed. Uh, they'll actually sign the Camp David Accords, where they recognize each other as a country, and they recognize their lands. Uh, so he creates some kind of like stabilization in the Middle East. He's going to end the Panama Canal. He negotiates a new strategic arm limitation treaty, SALT II, with Russia. SALT II is never approved by Congress, because Russia is going to do some bad things, which we'll talk about in a second. But he also had a lot of frustrations. His biggest frustration is the Iranian Revolution. If you remember, all the way up until the 1950s, America had supported... So all the way in the 1950s under Eisenhower, we had supported the Shah or King of uh, Iran. We helped establish him and put him in power because he promised to be anti-communist. Uh, there is going to be a lot of resentment towards America for installing a dictator. The Iranian Shah was seen as not very religious. He was a bad ruler. He was not providing for his people. So there's going to be a religious revolution in Iran called the Iranian Revolution in 1979. They're going to install their head religious leader, the Ayatollah Khomeini. Iran will become a theocratic state that bases their law on Sharia law and Islamic fundamentalist doctrine. They're going to be anti-American. They're going to support terrorist organizations. One of the first things the new Iranian government does is they hold... Uh, 66 Americans at uh, Iranian University, and they hold them hostage. This is called the Iranian hostage crisis. And those will last from 1979 to 1980. They're going to be held hostage for 444 days. Again, Carter will be seen impotent on how to be able to handle this. He does try to do a rescue ops, but like the two helicopters that are going there crash into each other, so he just seems like a joke, just like Ford. And we can't do anything to rescue our own citizens. So this, again, 1970s, bad time for America. The last thing that happens is 
Afghanistan during this time does have a revolution. Uh, Afghanistan was kind of uh, moderately friendly with the Soviets. There's going to be a move in Afghanistan to become a little bit more independent. And because of this, Russia is going to invade Afghanistan. So what happens in 1979, 1980, Russia invades Afghanistan. This is going to lead to America uh, starting to give weapons and guns to Afghani rebels, the Mujahideen. Mujahideen. Uh, we're going to actually train some of them. The CIA will. One of the people we train is Osama bin Laden because they're fighting communist Russia. Uh, America is going to boycott the 1980s Olympics because of Russia's active aggression. And we try to make Afghanistan like Vietnam was to us for Russia. Uh, also, Congress will not sign SALT II. And the Afghanistan uh, invasion uh, is really going to be what uh, ends detente. This takes us to 1980, where we're about to have an election, which we'll talk about next class. Here are some people from some pictures from the Iranian hostage crisis. And that's all I have for you for today, kiddos. Until next time, do 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 deuces, 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 yeah.